Welcome to Unit 4 from the Queensland Physics Syllabus, written by the QCAA. This is about uh, Chapter 9, Special Relativity. We'll be doing Chapter 9 and 10 in this unit, uh, where we look at all the different ways that we can understand what's going on with Einstein's theory of special relativity. So we've got a number of aims for this chapter. There is one formula down the bottom there, but all these aims come from the uh, direct from the syllabus. So we're going to look at why we needed special relativity, as in what was wrong with Newtonian physics. Look at um, what an inertial reference frame is. Look at the underlying um, assumptions that special relativity has, or the, the postulates. We can recall how motion is uh, relative to an observer, and how that feeds into the idea of simultaneity. And look at some of the consequences of a constant speed of light. That basically comes out as things like time dilation, where we start to look at proper time and relativistic time and so on. And we're going to do a number of co uh, calculations in that. And that's why our formula down the bottom here is about time dilation. When we get on to chapter 10, we'll have a look at length contraction and some paradoxes and situations like that. There's a few notes there just to think about um, your external exam that will be coming up at the end of this section. So I encourage you to pause the slide and just read slowly through those so you kind of understand. Just have a think for a moment. If you're sitting in a room, you've got absolutely no view of the outside whatsoever, no windows or anything. Can you tell if the room is at rest or in constant motion? As in, if you were sitting in a car and you couldn't see outside that car, say you'd fallen asleep in the car, would you know if the car is at rest or moving at a constant velocity? Now the car example is a bit weird because the car is not going to sit flat on the road. The idea of this scenario is if you think, what evidence would you have that you're moving? If you're accelerating, you could probably feel that. If you're moving in different directions and so on, you'd probably feel that too. But if you're moving at a constant velocity in one direction, would you ever have any evidence to know that you're actually moving if you could not see outside? And the answer to that is no. You'd have no idea if you are in fact at rest or in constant motion. And that's sort of the idea of what we want you to think about when it comes to relativity. It depends on what your frame of reference is. If your frame of reference is inside that car, You've got absolutely no evidence whatsoever that you're moving, whether you're at a constant velocity or you're at rest. And that's sort of how we need to start to think about different forms of motion. And that's kind of the, the questions that started to be asked a couple of hundred years after Newton, Newton came up with his ideas, where people in the late 1800s started to say, hang on a minute, there's more to this. We need a better theory to explain this. And Einstein was the one that did that for us. These videos here come from the um, Oxford website. A lot of this work is based on the uh, textbook by Walding. So um, I do encourage you to have a look at these particular videos, these uh, little links and so on that they have listed in there. Uh, it's worth your while having, having a go at some of those. So first thing I want to talk about is chapter 9.1, Special Relativity. And as I mentioned, you can thank Einstein for this one. Einstein, most of us realise, was uh, German-born, born in the late 1800s, died in the middle of the 20th century. He's most famous for developing his theory of relativity, and this is one of the major influences in science in modern times. And that's why I sort of set that point there. It's a massive influence on the direction of science, and was a massive breakthrough, breakthrough, and that's why we still talk about him. He did get the Nobel Prize in 1921 for the uh, for his work on the photoelectric effect. Think of that as basically like think like a, a solar panel. You have photons of light coming in, like those little red squiggly lines, striking a surface, which imparts energy into it, and you can have charged particles or electrons uh, coming off, being liberated, and that's why it's called the photoelectric effect. The photo bit means the light. The electric bit means the charged particles or electrons coming off it. 
The simplest way to think about this is something like a, uh, a solar panel does exactly that on an ongoing basis. Now, it did start off living in uh, Germany, but kind of unfortunate for the times. Um, there was these world wars that started coming along and he didn't really agree with what Hitler was doing. Ended up in Switzerland and ended up in the US after that. Einstein was the one that spoke to um, President Roosevelt uh, of the US and said, we need to start investigating more powerful bombs because he knew what was possible through his work. And he knew that if the Allies didn't start uh, doing that sort of work, the Axis powers were going to, and that would probably end up being bad for the other side. So his recommendation became what morphed into the Manhattan Project, and that was the project in World War II, top secret, to develop atomic bombs. There were only two that were ever developed that were ever actually used in a war. That's the little boy and fat man, dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. No other atomic bomb has ever actually been used as of this date in any sort of war type scenario. But uh, his work in relativity was fundamentally about light. And he was fairly ahead of his time because he was sort of stopped and asked the question, exactly what is light and what does it mean? What, how do we describe what light actually is? And that's what sort of where he jumped off from there. So if we go back a bit further, Galileo Galilei, you gotta wonder what his parents were thinking when they named him. Back in the 1600s, he tried to attempt to measure the speed of light. So he basically stood on one mountain top like this one here and opened a, a shutter on a lantern. So the light streamed out. He had an assistant on an opposing hill a fair distance away. I think it was about a mile away. When the assistant saw the light from Galileo's lantern, in that second picture there, he opened his shutter and then the light traveled back to Galileo. And what he tried to do was measure with his uh, pulse what the speed of light might be. As in, if we know the time that it takes to travel a particular distance, you can work out the speed or the velocity of that light. All right, speed is distance over time. But he basically concluded that it was way too fast to be measured by this method and better instruments would be needed to do it. We can calculate nowadays knowing what the speed of light is, that's how long it would have taken the light to reach the opposite hill. And clearly Galileo was never ever gonna measure that with his pulse. So look at our last three dot points. Can we travel faster than light? Essentially no, that is the speed limit of the universe. Can you travel into the past or into the future? Have a think about that one. In science fiction, you can all the time. But in reality, the answer is again, no. We'll see examples of how you can travel into somebody else's future, but you're not really traveling into the future like you think of in science fiction. That last point there is an interesting one. If you ran at the speed of light with the mirror in your hand, would you see your own reflection? You would still see your own reflection as you approach the speed of light. But when you actually reach the speed of light, kind of things work a bit differently at that point and for all intents and purposes you can pretty much say the answer is no when you're actually at the speed of light because time is standing still we'll look at more examples of that later all right in this chapter we're going to look at this section of the chapter we're going to look at frames of reference or in particular inertial frames of reference which a lot of the time i'll abbreviate to ifr inertial frame of reference or inertial reference frame sometimes, okay? And we'll look at the postulates for the theory of special relativity. What do I mean by postulates? Oh, I've told you down the bottom here. By the end of this, you should be able to describe the underlying axioms or assumptions that special relativity is based on and understand why Newtonian physics wasn't really doing its job anymore and how we found many examples of how it just didn't quite hold true under a lot of circumstances. So let's talk about relativity. And we can thank, as I've said, Albert for that one. In 1905, he had a theory of special relativity, which was basically a theory about measurement of things, how we measure space and time and energy with respect to things moving, moving quite fast. It dealt, deals with uh, the inertial reference frame. 
that I'll refer to a few times, in particular high speed motion. It was a little bit later in 1914 that he had his theory of general relativity, which was a much more encompassing theory um, that basically involved gravity and included gravity in the whole equation. Okay. So I referred to a reference frame a few times. A reference frame is basically how you view something. If we've got uh, this person here in blue, they're looking at that little red circle and they're looking along this pathway and they can describe from their set of axes, Z1, Y1, X1, what the direction of that red dot is. But the other person over here has a different uh, set of reference because his location is different. So the red dot is going to be in a different direction for him based on his axes, much like the coordinates given just there. But essentially a reference frame is just this arbitrary set of axes that we use in order to measure the motion of other things. So if person A, the blue person, knows exactly where person B is, the, the other colour one, then they can calculate the coordinates that the other person will give. If you know where the other person is from you, from your reference frame, you can work out what their reference frame is and work out what their coordinates will be. And that's kind of how we're going to look at these things as we compare different reference frames for different examples later in this chapter. Now, if the reference frame is moving, all right, so for example, let's say one person is moving and we have a particular velocity that your frame of reference is moving from. If you're at rest and your reference frame is at rest, you might look at point P here and say, oh, it's sitting over there in that position. But if you're in this moving reference frame, so perhaps you're in a car moving past, and you're moving that way, it would appear to you that point P is moving in the opposite direction. Okay, so I want you to sort of think about that idea. When you're moving, we think about moving in a car or something like that, or moving on a train or whatever. You can look around inside the train and consider that to be your reference frame. And the outside the window, intuitively, we know that we're moving with respect to the ground. But if you're looking with inside the, the train, that everything outside you is moving past you. It's two different ways of thinking about things. So there, A, stays, A still says that the object P is stationary, but B sees it moving past them because they have a particular velocity. So. Is there any absolute reference frame? Essentially, no. All right. You might look inside the room that you're sitting in right now, or you could say it's in the center of the Earth or the center of the galaxy. You could say it's the center of the universe is not moving, but we don't really know where that is, so you can't really use that. So there isn't any real absolute reference frame. We just have to decide on what we're going to call our particular reference frame. Um, Think about this uh, example here from a Newtonian point of view. Suspend a ball on a string. If you're standing there holding that string, nothing is happening. The ball will swing. The, the ball just hangs there vertically. If you rotate that ball, much like we did in um, Unit 3 where we did the circular motion prax, we've got our nice formulas and we can describe why the ball is rotating because you are standing still and you are rotating the ball around you. So if that's your frame of reference, everything's good. However, if your frame of reference is the ball, one moment you can just be hanging there, and for the next moment, for no apparent reason, you're swinging around, you're swinging out. Okay? That's a different frame of reference, and you would describe the motion totally differently depending on whether you're standing still or whether you're standing still on the ball that's actually swinging around the outside. So, an inertial reference frame is what we consider to be a non-accelerating reference frame. All right? And that's mainly what we deal with in a lot of our work. It's when you get onto special relativity that the uh, accelerating reference frames start to come into it. But note this point, non-accelerating with respect to what? There is no static reference point. We just simply pick 
the reference point we want. Okay, that man could be walking along, the reference frame could be this particular ground. But if you're sitting on this box, you will see the ground moving away from you in that direction as the man walks forward. Okay, it's all to do with your frame of reference. So, you need a frame of reference to measure motion from. All motion is relative to that frame of reference. It doesn't matter whether the frame of reference you pick is the ground and you watch the train moving past, or your frame of reference is inside that train carriage watching the ground moving past you. It is relative to where you are picking your frame of reference. That's the relativity part. Okay? Um, note my point there in the pink cloud. We deal with inertial reference frames here. Non-inertial reference frames or accelerating reference frames come in in general relativity, as I said before. And we've got some nice examples here on the slide about inertial reference frames. All right. Obviously, the Earth is not really at rest. It is rotating around its axis. It is rotating around the sun. The sun is rotating around the Milky Way. The Milky Way is moving within the universe. But we consider that to be at rest. Right, a couple of postulates or the, the things that we base special relativity on. Number one, the laws of physics are the same for all observers in all reference frames. And number two, the speed of light is constant. It has the value C everywhere. The question I've asked there, is the second one really needed? Probably not, because we have this one here that just says, the laws of physics are always the same, and we know the speed of light is constant, so therefore it should be constant everywhere. And we'll look at how we get around that when we start moving and how we have paradoxes and how we resolve them. A uh, little question there, challenge 9.1. I encourage you to stop and have a look at that one. He's riding a graviton that spins at a constant speed, an example of an inertial reference frame. Have a think about that. Is that an inertial reference frame if your speed is constant? The resolution to this one is your speed may well be constant, but your velocity is not constant. And velocity is more important than speed because it includes the direction. Your velocity is changing because you are not traveling in a straight line. You are traveling around in a circle. So the direction you're moving is constantly changing. You are undergoing centripetal acceleration the whole time as we looked at back in Unit 3. So therefore, you are under acceleration. You do not really have an inertial reference frame. All right, so let's look at an example, uh, muon decay. Muon's a subatomic particle that's um, when cosmic rays hit the atmosphere, they collide with the oxygen and nitrogen, and then we have the subatomic particles called pions created. There's a few ways of pronouncing that. Within a couple of meters, these will decay into muons and muon neutrinos. So the, muot the muons are the ones we're interested in because we build detectors to detect these. And they tend generally continue in the same direction that the uh, cosmic ray was originally traveling at. And they're more than 0.99% the speed of light. Sorry. Generally, they're traveling at more than 99% the speed of light or 0.99% the speed of light. Now, the average lifespan of a muon is 2.2 microseconds before it decays. Some muons are going to decay before reaching Earth, all right? But in studying these muons, we actually have proof of Einstein's theory of relativity. And the proof we start to get is how time slows and distances contract. So what do I mean by that? Let's look at this example here. There was an a, a, um, experiment done over in uh, California, I think it was, over in the US somewhere, where you had an observatory way up the top of the mountain here. And the mountain is almost two kilometers high. And they put a neutrino detector up there, and, and did, sorry, a muon detector up there, and detected how many muons there were. 563 per hour. Okay. Now, when we uh, looked at how long, how big this distance was in a Newtonian view, and how long it would take those muons to take to travel to the 
surface down the bottom here, what we sort of calculated was at the base here of the mountain here, when you put that exact same detector that was up the top here, down the bottom here, you should detect about 29 per hour, 29 muons per hour. However, that's not really what happened. What we detected was 409 per hour. So the question became, why is this wrong? Why are so few decaying in that time? So from our point of view, this is the observer's reference frame. The distance that they're traveling is almost two kilometers. The time to travel that would be about 23 microseconds. But from the muons frame of reference at this ridiculously fast speed, that's not actually two kilometers because the whole distance is contracting. To them, to the muon, it's actually only 183 meters, and the time to travel it is about 2.2 microseconds. So very few of them have enough time in 2.2 microseconds to decay. What I'm saying with this example is what's going on in the muons frame of reference is totally different to what's going on in our frame of reference. Even though we're talking about the same physical distance that they've got to travel, because the muon's traveling so fast, 0.9953, the speed of light, the distances are not the same for them, and the time is not the same. And when we use Einstein's calculations, they tell us that that's how many muons we should detect per hour at the bottom of the mountain based on the length contraction of the mountain and the time dilation that's actually going on. And these are things that we're going to start to explore later in this chapter and into chapter 10. Okay, have a look at some of these uh, extra little uh, videos on the screen there. I encourage you to look at. You can even wear your fuzzy slippers when you have a look at those too. Here's a little task for you to do before you finish. <clears throat> Can you write 50 to 100 words to explain how the muon decay could not be explained by Newtonian physics? Essentially, it's about the fact that there was a discrepancy in how many muons we calculated we should detect at the bottom of the mountain and how many we actually did calculate at the bottom of the mountain. I encourage you also to look at question 10 on page 270 of your textbook. Check him out. Got a nice little picture here. Uh, just to give you a bit of reference about the size of our solar system. The light from Earth to the Moon, about 1.3 light seconds. Earth to Mars, 4.3 light minutes is about the shortest it's ever going to be. It's about 23 minutes for light to travel from Earth to Mars, or a signal, an electromagnetic signal, to travel from Earth to Mars, or vice versa, at its absolute furthest. And that means when Earth's on one side of the sun and Mars is on the other side of the sun. You can probably uh, assume that it's about an average of 20 minutes is a good guide for a signal between Earth and Mars. So it makes it very long to have a phone call. You ask a question, they receive it 20 minutes later, they re respond straight away. You receive the response 40 minutes after you started. And there's a few other ones there to give you an idea of how far out things are. Pluto's a long way out, but the Kuiper Belt is even further out. Okay, have a look at the checking learning questions and then look ahead at uh, 9.2 and you can have to see what's coming. Thanks for coming, guys. Oh, one last thing. Check out this video before the next lesson. I've got the link at the top there or you've got the name of it down there. Google it, see if you can find it. It's only 2 minutes 30, it's only a short one. Watch that before next time. Thanks a lot.